full drops of nectar coming into these flow frames. It's a really strong smell of honey is wafting from these hives up into our office here as these bees grab the nectar from the Melaleuca flowers, which is down here on these flatlands, and they bring it back up into the hive and they're just splashing it around the cell walls to dry it out. And the aroma is just incredible. It's, it's like you can smell it even from a few hundred meters away from these hives as they're, as they're really making their honey. What we're going to do today is both a flow frame inspection, just for fun, as well as a brood inspection. This little hive over here, we inspected so, a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago, and the, we thought it was queenless, but we found a laying queen, luckily. And in some of these frames here, you could see the larvae glistening down the cells. And what we're going to do is get back in there, have a look, check that we've got capped brood and everything is going well in this hive. So we'll have a quick look at that. And then we're going to show you how to inspect flow frames, should you want to do that as well. So we've already got our smoker going. Now, if you've got questions, please put them in the comments and Trace will read those questions out and we'll answer them as we go. Also let us know whereabouts in the world you're tuning in from. It's really interesting to us to hear where you're from. Okay, sometimes the smoker needs a few puffs just to get going again, especially if you've only just started it. And what you want to do is have nice, cool smoke. While you're doing that, you can smoke your hands just to mask some of your own smells from the bees. And then put this back in front of the entrance so any returning bees will get that waft of the scent. So you make sure you put on your bee suit, protect yourself, especially if you're new to beekeeping, uh, wear your gloves as well. Okay, while you're thinking of those questions, let's get into it and pop the lid off this and just check that we have a laying queen. So pulling off the gabled roof, we'll just put that aside. And next we need our J tool. This is the one that comes with our suits and smoker kit. And what we're going to do is just lever off the inner cover. Bearing in mind the queen could be on this surface because there's no excluder between the brood box and the inner cover. Okay, I'm not seeing a queen there, but sometimes you do see her just wandering around on the inside of the inner cover, just to make sure I'll lean that up against the hive. Now I'm seeing a similar amount of bee numbers to before, showing that we haven't really had a boom in bee numbers yet. Over here in this section, it's pretty light on. It's not looking like it's ready for a super yet. So what we're going to do is take out a, uh, a frame. Now what I'm looking for is a frame that's easy to get out at first. The first one's the tricky one because it, uh, it has to be pulled out vertically, whereas as soon as you've got one out, you can go sideways first. I'm looking for a nice straight one. I'm going to choose this one here. Adding a little smoke to get the bees away from that area. And away we go. So, first of all, breaking the joins between the frames. J hook goes under the end. And check for any burr comb here. You can chop that off like that. Um, you don't want that dragging on the comb surface as you lift the frame up. And being careful of any bees slowly coming up. And it looks like we have quite a lot of empty cells here where there was once brood and we can tell by the darker patterning there where these cells have been used by brood and that they end up getting darker each time a layer of silk gets added from the emerging bees. Okay, I'm going to put that aside. I've got the frame rests, which also double as the shelf brackets for harvesting on the edge here. So I can neatly just put that frame aside. Now I could even put a second frame with that one, allowing plenty of room to manoeuvre in the hive. Down these cells, I'm having a quick look. I can't see 
any eggs. And seeing a little bit of nectar. So let's just progress through the hive. We might just jump forward a bit because I remember that the queen was actually over this side and laying on this side of the hive. Sometimes in the middle, sometimes they start on an edge. So let's have a look. There we go. We have some brood on this frame. That's good to see. So those young larvae have spun a silk cocoon around themselves and they'll spend about 11 days in that cocoon phase. And then they'll emerge as brand new baby bees into the hive, ready to start the chores of cleaning and looking after baby bees and producing wax and building comb and then finally moving on to foraging. So while I'm doing this, I'm looking for any signs of things like AFB or EFB where you might have dark sunken cappings, sometimes with piercings in them. And just always keeping an eye out for brood that looks unhealthy. What I'm seeing is a bit patchy here, so that automatically makes me tune in on that area if it's all a bit patchy. But down those cells, I see glistening white larvae. So this is actually all nice and healthy here. Great. Any questions coming in? Yeah, great, Cedar. We've got people too, like locals, people from Nimbin, and then all the way to California and India, all over the place, tuning in this morning. So that's pretty exciting. Fantastic. Isn't it amazing we can learn as a community on a global scale so and good. share the passion of beekeeping from people that are they're digging their hives out of snow to other ones that are in the hot, dry depth. Yeah. Of the northern rivers. Well, this is actually a local woman. Um, Vicky, actually, I spoke to her yesterday on the phone. Lives just up the road here. Um, she's, she had two queens in her flow hive last week and almost a full frame of drone, drone brood and drone cells. She was just wondering why that would happen. Okay, two queens. Um, that's interesting but you do find that sometimes so it's not completely abnormal generally there's one laying queen in a hive but there can be this kind of changeover period where where they do raise a, a new queen and um, they've still got the old queen now um, usually uh, it, there's all sorts of dynamics here if, if you've got a, um, a young virgin queen emerging she'll go around and actually sting any queen cells to make sure she's the one that gets to reign in the hive um, but in this case they've, they've raised another queen and the old queen's still there now um, all sorts of reasons why and if you've got um, some interesting thoughts on that you can put it in the, in the comments but um, it is um, relatively relatively normal to find occasionally two queens in your hive so well done for spotting them and um, the next part of the question was um, then why would there be all these drone cells okay so um, maybe that's the piece of the puzzle that's missing if um, if you've got lots and lots of drones it um, there's, there's two reasons one is the queens run out of sperm in order to fertilize the eggs and then she can only lay drones and the other reason could be that uh, you've got no queen at all and then the workers start laying drones or laying eggs that are unfertilized and they also turn into drones so they're the two reasons why you get all drones um, but in this case you've got two queens and lots of drones so what you'll need to do is come back into your hive in say three weeks time have a look and see whether you're getting a nice amount of brood, uh, worker brood that is. I'm not sure if we have a good example of what worker brood and drone brood is, but yeah, I'm not 100% in your case why um, you've got so many drones at, at this time of year. In the springtime you usually get uh, more drones because they're actually preparing to share their genetic material around as lots of hives are building up and trying to swarm so those drones will be flying off to a drone congregation area 
waiting for a queen to fly past so they can mate. Um, we're seeing some more brood here. So this queen's only really just getting started. Down the cells I'm looking for eggs and I can see lots of tiny eggs like grains of rice in the bottom of the cells, like tiny little grains of rice. I don't think you'll be able to see it. Uh, but in this region here, if you look very closely, down the cells is these tiny little grains of rice being the eggs. And it's good to have a look because that also tells you a little bit about your hive. If you see multiple eggs laid in, in the cells and eggs laid on the side walls, you can start to assume that's the workers laying eggs and they'll turn into drones. Or sometimes you can get a, a young queen that's just hasn't quite got it together yet and she's, she's dropping multiple eggs at once. But if they're sitting nice and neat in the bottom, just a single egg in the bottom of the cell, then that's perfect. That's what you want to see. Fantastic. See, the Abdul's asking, wondering why these got, I'm um, not sure whereabouts they're from, why there's lots of bees outside the flow hive entrance at night. Okay, so if you've got a really strong colony and it's, particularly if it's warm in the night, then you'll find a whole lot of bees just enjoying the uh, breeze, but more importantly, just making some room in the hive for ventilation. If the hive's packed full of bees, the temperature will get too high at that point if it's, if it's nice and warm. So a lot of bees will vacate, allowing nice circulation. So it's a sign that you've got a very healthy hive. Now, if it was in the springtime, um, or in a season that uh, perhaps you're in the Northern Hemisphere and they might be gearing up to swarm and divide their colony, which is a natural tendency. Some hives, more so than others, will be gearing up to swarm in the springtime. So if it is, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and it is that time of year when you're going to get lots of swarms, then it could be a great idea to get in there, take a split, relieve that pressure, allow more room for your bees, and that way you'll also get another hive out of it as well. And if you don't want it, somebody else surely will. Right. Um, Cedar Jeff is asking, and you mentioned this a bit before about the dark frames. Just wondering why do the frames get darker and darker year after year? And then what's left in the cells after those bees emerge? So the young larvae spins a silk cocoon around itself and there's a fine layer of silk left in the cell and the tint. So after it's been used multiple times, that will really build up. So if it's been used multiple times for brood, it'll get darker and darker. Bee footprints also makes the, the wax darker as well. So the longer it's been used in the hive, for any reason, it'll get darker, but particularly in the brood, like you can see this one here, is getting, it's getting darker and darker. It's been used many times for brood. It'll eventually get kind of black. And at some point, you'll want rotate it out of the hive and give them a nice fresh start. So you can put those dark ones closer to the edge when you do your inspections and when all the brood has emerged you can then take it out of the hive or if you're using naturally drawn comb like this you can shake the bees off and just cut it out in the field and put the frame straight back in. Bearing in mind you want to take the old wax away in case it's got some honey in it you don't want to um, have a robbing scenario where bees will go for that honey and share pathogens from one hive to the next. But that's why the, the comb gets darker. It's just from use by the bees, particularly the brood. I'm seeing a lot of pollen. Bees will use about a frame of pollen and a frame of honey to, to raise a frame of brood. So it gives you an idea of the, the importance of the pollen and honey stores. Here's some more uh, beautiful pollen here, some different colours, some oranges and whites. And it will really range. It might be easier if I put my shadow on it here to, to really see the um, colours there of oranges and whites and creams and the different flowers. You can, get, you can even get blue pollen, um, some rich red pollen sometimes. And what they're doing 
is they're, they're scraping that pollen off their hind legs when they, they bring it in and they're shoving it down the cell with their head. They're mixing it in with some enzymes, topping it with a little bit of honey and letting it ferment into bee bread. Like a good sourdough, it becomes easier to digest once the enzymes have done their thing and it's turned into a bread. So bees don't eat pollen. Um, it, that's actually used primarily to feed to the young larvae as bee proteins to, to grow from a grub into a baby bee. Wow, that looks so beautiful um, on, the, on the video. Ali, behind the lens today. Um, see, the Joanne's asking down in Victoria and Melbourne here in Australia, and just wondering over winter, um, she, they've got a couple of uncapped flow frames. What should they do with those? Okay, there's a, there's a few things you can do. If they're uncapped but they've got a lot of nectar in them, then you might want to, if you've got a freezer, put them in a freezer. That's the, the easiest way to go. And then you can just pull them back out in the springtime, put them back on your hive again. That's if you're planning to take the hive, the, the uh, flow super off the hive. In cold climates, we'll often take their honey boxes off the hive, especially if they've got multiple of them. Other people tend to move the excluder and let the bees just consume that nectar. So that's another thing you could decide to do. If you're running a configuration like this, you might want to leave that nectar for the bees to consume uh, over the winter time. Um, you might want to ask your local beekeepers for advice on that. Uh, Another thing you could decide to do is actually um, harvest that bee nectar, wash the frames out and, and put them away. And that's a bit more work and what you're going to get is um, bee nectar, not honey, which has quite a strong flavour and, um, and you'll probably, it'll ferment quite quickly so it'd be good for making something like mead and that will um, uh, that will give you something to do with that bee nectar. Um, you could probably make an amazing drink out of it as well. Um, so the other thing you could do is, uh, um, yeah, if you're not going to harvest it, you could wait till the bees have consumed the honey and then take the frames out. That's another way to go. Right. Cedar, is there any, Debbie's asking, is there any other um, option up to um, calm down angry bees um, without having to get a new queen, or is that what you have to actually do? So, if you've got a, an aggressive hive, you, you need to decide whether that's a problem for you or not. Perhaps you're okay with that and you can wear your bee suit and it's not near where it's going to bother other people, and you can just um, really protect yourself, choose a nice sunny day like this, but not too windy, use a lot of smoke and they'll be at their calmest. And if you can work with them like that, then that's okay. If you decide that it's um, not workable and you'd really prefer a calm hive where you can get in there and um, do it gloves on and so on, then you will need to requeen. And as you say, you, you'll need to um, take out the old queen and introduce a new queen about 24 hours later into the hive. And if you're not comfortable doing that process, particularly with a hive that's gotten a bit aggressive, then get somebody with experience to come and help you. Great, see look, um, just noticing um, a couple of people, Bailey's noticed that we're not using wires or foundation in our uh, brood frames. Mm. Um, any, any reason for that? Um, for me, there's a number of reasons. One is I'm um, so grateful that I don't have to go through that tedious process of wiring up the frames and putting in the foundation. Um, the bees just make it themselves. That's what they're, they're, they do. So all you need is a good comb guide, a little bit of um, checking in the beginning to make sure they're going straight and pushing them back in line if you need to. And then what you have is no foundation at all, just perfectly natural cells that the bees have sized for, for them and there's said to be some health benefits for that rather than forcing them into a cell size, you just let them do their natural thing. Another thing is you're not introducing foreign wax into your hive. Wax should be properly pasteurised 
but sometimes um, I guess there could be issues of um, build-ups of who knows uh, insecticides or or pathogens in in the wax you're introducing into your hive also um, but I've done many many years of putting foundation into hives and it's my choice now not to and I don't need to these frames in a centrifuge so I don't need the reinforcing in there of either uh, wires or a plastic foundation. Having said that the downside is, and I'll, I'll just show you, there's a, there's a few downsides, there's always a bit of compromise with every choice you make in, in beekeeping. Uh, but you can see here that um, there's nothing really holding that wax in. Now this is pretty established, they've connected it all the way down the sides. It's not that heavy with honey. I can actually tilt that over. But when it's fresh, if you do that, the wax will just fall out because it's not actually joined to the sides. So that's something to get used to if you decide to try naturally drawn comb like this. Um, and another one is they're more likely to go wonky. Even with foundation, you'll find the bees will go wonky sometimes and start joining to other combs. But with no foundation at all, they're more likely to go a bit wonky and you have to actually interfere and push them back online because you do need nice straight frames like that in order to be able to service the hive. So it's, um, I just like to let them do it naturally and it's less work as well. Um, up here it's quite interesting that they're making more like six millimeter cells drone size or They'll also do that where they don't plan to use it for brood. So this was close to the edge of the hive. You've got some big cells about the size of the flow frame cells. And well away from the bottom of that size too because it stores more honey. And down here you've got more like the, the 5.3 millimetre cells, much smaller, that they do plan to use for brood. Um, they will use the large ones for drone brood as well. So the bees know what they're doing they're giving themselves choices. They're sizing the cells how they like it. And um, that's uh, a good thing, I think. But pitch in if you've got differing opinions to that. Pitch in on the thread. And um, it's always interesting for people to get a whole lot of different opinions uh, about beekeeping. And then you can make up your own mind as to what works for you. Exactly, and as you say, see to ask a beekeeper and you'll get 10 beekeepers and you'll get 10 <laughs> different answers. So. Yeah, exactly. 20 different answers from 10 beekeepers. Yeah. <laughs> see, Eric lives in northern, uh. in the States, United States, and will um, say that they will need to add a medium box above their full brood frame. Um, so it will be uh, above the brood box but under the flow super. Just wondering, should they put the queen excluder on top of the medium box? Uh, depends whether you're planning to collect, I think the, uh, it's getting a bit warm. And my microphone just fell down the shirt. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, oh, I'll, see go. I'll just check that we can hear <laughs> your seeds. I'll just mute it while I, while I organise that. Perhaps you can um, answer that question for me, Chase. Oh. <laughs> I can't remember. Now, I think it depends what you'd like, whether you'd like the queen, um, whether you want honey or brood in your super, um, in your medium. Um, otherwise, I think that would be the answer. Otherwise, you'll just end up with nice honeycomb um, and keep the queen down in the brood box. That, that would be my answer. But, you know, you could ask Cedar and he'll tell you something completely different. <laughs> go we're just getting seeds microphone sorted here so Ali's doing some awesome shops shots in the brood box it's very hot here today it is autumn but we've had so much rain and now we're having this beautiful weather hot days cool nights and we've had so much rain it's very green around here at the moment so we're pretty pretty blessed at the moment for our weather okay give me the thumbs up if you can hear me now should be coming through okay again Yes, that's good seeds. Okay, great. Um, 
keep those questions coming. It's fantastic to be getting them all. I did promise that I would be inspecting some flow frames as well because we do that less often, but it's nice to, to learn how to do that as well and really tune in with what's going on and match what's going on in the windows to, to the um, observations from the outside. So, so um, or to, the, to what's going on on the inside of the hive. So what I'm going to do is actually put this hive back together. I'm happy that, that we've got laying brood. I don't need to go and find the queen again. I know she's in there. So what I'm going to do is um, add a little smoke to this hive over here in preparation for taking some of those flow frames out. Now, I'm also going to just put this hive back together in the same order, unless there's a reason not to. If you're cycling frames, that's a reason not to put it back in the same order. But otherwise, just move them back into the same order they were in. Reason being is sometimes you get a bulge of honey pressing up against another bulge of honey from another frame, and the bees can't service that area. And if you've got small hive beetles, they can be a menace and you use that area really to lay a lot of eggs, which isn't much fun. Okay. Can I, just a question's come on that before you close up that brood box. Just if you, like you haven't spotted the queen, but if you saw a queen cell, would you, would you destroy that queen cell or what, what would you do? Uh, that's a personal choice and more experienced beekeepers do tend to make that choice sometimes. If you don't know what you're doing, then leave it. Allow the bees to, to do what they do and make up their own mind. I wouldn't just go destroying every queen cell you find because you might find they're actually deciding to replace the queen for a reason. Um, it's a swarm prevention method. So in springtime, beekeepers will get in there, hack off some queen cells, sometimes transfer them to other splits they're doing and so on. Other times just destroy them and and uh, also make some space in the brood box with some brand new frames that they can then draw some fresh wax on and that'll limit the um, swarming behavior because you know it's hard to, to be around all day and wait for, for swarms to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't unless you really know what you're doing. Right. So the, um, Debbie's, um, no, and it's actually in Melbourne, another one from Melbourne. Just wondering, do we ever have chalk brood? And what do you do if you do find chalk brood? So if you find chalk brood, um, chalk brood is uh, a pathogen that gets in. And um, what you'll find is down the cells, you'll see what looks like a chalky mummy of a larva instead of a nice um, uh, grub in the bottom. So it actually dies and turns into um, like a little lump of chalk. And you'll know if you've got that because the bees will be discarding them out the entrance and you'll see a pile of them if you get up nice and early on the landing board or in front of the hive. Now, um, there's, it's, it's not a disease like AFB or EFB where you need to start again with your colony. It is actually a um, one that you can remedy by um, the first thing you do is move the hive into the sunshine. The damp environment is more conducive to chalk brood. And if, if that doesn't uh, alleviate the problem, then get in there and um, replace the queen for some genetics that are hopefully next time around you get bees that can do a better job of cleaning and kicking out that pathogen. Um, and that usually fixes up the problem. You might like to, to um, cycle out some of the the old frames as well and get rid of the pathogen load in the hive. Some people throw a bunch of banana skins in there and that's said to, um, to uh, uh, get the bees into a bit of a cleaning frenzy. It's like, it's like putting something really bad on your carpet. You decide to clean that, but you, you actually get carried away and clean the whole room, right? And, um, and uh, some people say it works, some people say it's a hoax. You let me know if it works for you. <laughs> That's great. Maybe we should do it with our kids. Just chuck some banana peels in the carpet and see if they start cleaning the house. <laughs> Cedar, oh, this is gorgeous. Maria's called in from South Australia and she's actually watching us eating her sourdough bread fresh out of the oven with honey on it. Oh, very nice. How delicious does that sound? Um, but look, um, her question is that she actually went into hospital for six days 
and before she went in her super was really really busy everything was going fabulous um, but when she's come out it's like there's hardly any bees left in her super also saying the weather's been strangely hot um, and is now going into autumn would there be what would be the best thing for her to do if she's concerned about that okay so um I think what you need to do is get in and check that there's a, a good laying queen still. Your bees may have swarmed. That's usually the reason why you've got a sudden disappearance. You look in the windows, there's lots of bees, and the next day there's almost none. Uh, uh, that's usually because half the bees have taken off and there's only enough bees to fill the bottom box. So you want to know that um, you've, you've still got a laying queen. So usually they get it together to raise another queen but sometimes they don't so you're going to want to get in there and just verify that I'm just scraping off some of the wax from here it's got no honey in it so um, even so it's a good idea not to leave it around uh, in case it does have a bit of honey you don't want to promote robbing and even leaving wax around some bees might decide to have a bit of a forage on it if you've got pathogens that will spread it around so take the wax with you um, and uh, keep it for making a candle with your kids or something. Nice. Chris, um, Chris is asking, do you generally have one queen per box or does the queen go from box to box? One queen per box. Um, unfortunately, it'd be great if there was multiple queens. Some people do run a multi-queen hive with a queen up here and a queen down the bottom and a couple of honey supers in between. And you can uh, get that going if you, if you put some effort in with, um, with a few tips and tricks. But generally there's one queen per box and she mates in the first few weeks of her life and then she has enough sperm to uh, go for up to six years of laying sometimes a couple of thousand eggs a day. Now there is a reason why she might decide to leave the hive and that's if they decide to, to split themselves and half the bees will swarm. Now in that case the bees will decide that it's time to swarm and they'll starve the queen. The queen doesn't feed herself. She gets fed by the workers. They'll stop feeding her. She gets thinner and then she's able to fly. And she will um, get pushed out of the hive by half the bees and off they'll go to make a new home. Great. Cedar um, uh, customer or a beekeeper's called in, Game Channel. I'm just wondering, they've seen a video of maybe sometimes some of the honey that's really thick won't f um, possibly flow out of the flow frames. What type of um, flowers causes this hard honey? So there's a few different, uh, there's two different things that will cause honey not to flow out of flow frames and it's unusual but there's um, what's called a thixotropic honey. So we we have some of that, but not enough to really uh, cause any issues. So when we see globules coming out, like jelly globules, they're collecting the medicinal uh, varieties from the leptospermins, and that's uh, like the manuka honey you get from New Zealand. And it, it t has this interesting property where in the jar you can stir it and it goes liquid, but then it sets into a jelly. Um, so the way beekeepers get that out, if they're harvesting with a, a conventionally or with a flow hive, is to um, prick the cells and then centrifuge them. So if you happen to get a lot of that, that honey, then it could be worth a lot and it could be worth your time to, to actually extract that and get the honey out of your flow frames that you then um, you can send away and get ratings for it and so on. And a lot of beekeepers make their living selling those medicinal honeys. Um, the, the other reason could be candied honey. Now, if you get really cold nights and you've got a specific flower that's prone to produce nectar that makes honey that uh, candies more easily, then that could happen. However, if you've got a situation where you've got the brood right underneath your frames, it doesn't usually go candied in the hive. It's more likely to go candied when you, if you take the honey away from the hive and it's able to really drop down in temperature and it'll set off the crystallization of that honey. The melaleuca that's coming in right now, which you can actually see here, is one that candies quite easily. Now, when we harvest this honey, we put it on the shelf, it's typically the winter time, and it will candy within a, a, several, a, within a few weeks usually. It'll start to show the signs of the sugar crystals and away it will go, forming a nice candy, which is a beautiful thing. My children far prefer 
what they call the crispy honey, which is the candied honey, uh, than the, the liquid hun honey, funnily enough. But other people go, oh no, it's gone bad and throw it away, which is completely ridiculous. It's still a beautiful thing and it's just got a, a different texture. Um, so you're getting back to your question. Um, if you get Dixotropic honey or candied honey in your flow frames and it, it, it partially candied honey will still come out, it'll just come out cloudy. Partially Thixotropic will still come out, it'll still come out in globules, but if you get severe candy or severe thixotropic properties then it won't come out and what you'll find is the harvesting process will usually disturb that honey enough that the bees will get in there and chew it out and um, and then you'll end up with this uh, situation where they will consume that candied or thixotropic honey and hopefully next time they put it uh, with, back with liquid honey but it's an issue both for harvesting with flow frames or harvesting in a conventional centrifuge. Great. See, the David's asking, have you got any tips for removing wax that's built up um, on his queen excluder? He said he tried melting it in the oven, but that wasn't too successful. I'm not sure if he's got the plastic. I gather he's got one of our queen excluders. Yeah, so generally you just scrape it with something like this. Good old elbow grease. Get in there, get, get enough wax off. You don't need to get it all off. The bees will... will um, do the rest for you. My smoke has just uh, run out of fuel, so I will top that up. Because I did promise I'd show you how to pull a flow frame out, so I'll do that now. Perfect. So I better uh, blow some smoke into this hive again, just by putting the smoker right in the entrance. Okay, now roof comes off. Next, we're going to take the inner cover off just by levering it like this. Now, you can see the nectar glistening as they're drying it out. We were showing that in the beginning, and you can see the way they're splashing it around the walls. And it's wonderful to start learning what the back looks like here and what that means for your hive. So, it, it looks a bit um, it's hard to, to get enough shadow on this hive to get a good image of it. We'll try that here. You can see that um, there's, there's even little droplets being, being spread around here and there's the, the, the meniscus is quite flat. It's really quite liquid and it's, it's not standing up when it's thicker. So that's what it looks like when they're starting to really dry out that nectar and you'll see that during the day then in, in the evening you might see that that's all gone. They've used that surface area to dry out some of the honey and then they've moved it inwards to finish packing some of the cells. So it's a great process to watch and it's quite different to when you see a patchwork of full cells, empty cells, full cells, empty cells, which is when they're actually uncapping and eating some of the honey away. So it tells you different things about beekeeping, just observing what's going on in your flow frames. Okay, so to, to get a flow frame out, you, you do need to remove the um, rear cover here. Reason being is when you put the flow frame back in, you don't want this to be a um, guillotine as it comes down to any bees that are on that metal strip. So I'm going to choose a frame to pull out. Now there's three lifting points. One is under here. I'm just going to loosen that up. There's another one under here should you need it. And there's another one at the back here. And what you're doing for that first one, the first one's harder to get out because you have to go vertically upwards. I'm going to lift up that frame by holding it at this end once I've used the J tool and getting under the lip at this end and up we come. Oh, look at that, quite a lot of honey stored in that frame, which is a good sign. We've got We've got a flow coming on and what looks like um, happened is typical when the bees get a bit hungry they might eat some of the honey out above the brood nest here. So they're busy filling that up, you can see the shining nectar and in a week or less this will be complete and ready to harvest and hopefully at the same time they'll fill in this area showing a nice full frame of honey for us to harvest. There's more honey in this than I expected. So that's wonderful. 
So Cedar, would you um, take any of that honey out now, even though you can't see it um, at the back of those frames? Look, if you'd seen this, you could definitely have some honey if you didn't have any inside. But otherwise, just wait if you've got enough honey on the shelf. Wait for them to fill it up a bit more and, and for them to finish uh, drying out these cells. The danger is if, they're, um, if you're harvesting and there's too much nectar in it, then the moisture content will be too high and then the honey won't keep on the shelf. It might not be a problem if you're like me and the honey gets consumed quite quickly. But if you're planning to sell it to people who are going to leave it sitting around on the shelf for a while, you do need to make sure it's nice and thick in the jar with it up around about 18% moisture. And that will um, mean it will keep on the shelf for a long time. Isn't that beautiful to see the bees do their amazing work producing their honey? We've got time for a couple more questions. Okay, cool. Um, um, Kay's wondering if the bees do decide to swarm, are there generally enough bees left in the hive to sort of keep the co colony multiplying and producing? There is, but it's a, a, it's a week time where you may need to get in there and manage the beetles. If you've got the small hive beetle, those little black beetles, there was a few running around earlier, then uh, you, you want to activate the pest management tray at the bottom, put some oil in it, catch the beetles, give the bees a hand, make sure that when the hive is weak that those little beetles aren't taking over. Now another thing you could do if, the, if they are uh, really low in numbers is remove the super altogether, reduce it to a brood box, make sure you're catching beetles and um, get in there and have a look over uh, in, um, maybe in, in three or four weeks time, make sure there is a laying queen and the hive is on the way to building up again, ready for you to store some honey in the flow frames again. Right. So putting a frame back in, now especially the last one, so basically you want to end up with a nice flat wall here. If they're all higgledy piggledy and one's pushed back and one's forward then bees can escape between them and it just looks a bit messy as well. So we want to make sure the frames are pushed forward. Now there's a little screw at the back here which um, in this case has been wound out to make sure the frames are pushed forward. So there's an adjustment there depending on the size of your box. You can also use a, a stick like a, a comb guide to go along the back here to adjust it if you, if you um, don't want to wind out those screws. Now, to put it back in, I find the best way is to start like that. And that way you've got the spacing right between the two frames. And sometimes you might need to lever these frames over in order to make enough space. Then you can slide down that clear face like this and drop the other end in. And once you've dropped the other end in, you can then go slowly down, keeping the frame this way to form a nice flat window. If you pull it back, it might overlap with some of the other frames. And that way you can just go straight down and leave your finger under there while you make sure there's no bees at this point here, because you don't want to drop and squash a bee there. There's one just there, you get that out of the way, and then I can let it fall back down into position. And what we end up with is a nice flat face here. No bees can escape and we're happy. Nice work. Cedar, um, Barbie's asking, they bought a nucleus of bees, but the, the brood frames that they had had foundation on them, um, but they've put them in with the flow hive in the brood box, but ours don't have foundation. Does that matter? Does she need to worry about that? It doesn't matter at all. My father likes to mix it up and have a couple with foundation and a couple with, w without. The reason being is that that foundation or the frames that are already built will give a nice guide and get you on the way to having nice straight frames. Um, whereas sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. If you, ha if you just dump a swarm of bees or a package of bees into an empty box with only comb guides, um, they will usually draw on the comb guides, but sometimes they'll just go completely sideways. So having some foundation in there isn't a bad idea. Mix it up, see what works for you. You can use plastic foundation, wax foundation, or no foundation at all if you put out strips in place. There is actually one uh, state in Australia where um, the, the law is you, you need to use um, at least a little bit of foundation in your frame. So that's an interesting one to watch out for also. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the, the rest of the world, I believe you can go ahead and just use the comb guides. 
Thank you very much for all your questions. It sounded like you had one more there, Trace. Look, I, just because you've got your hand right there on that inner cover plug and someone's question is, what is that um, hole in there for? Okay, so this hole allows you to do a few things, but one is you can pull that out and put a feeder there. So there is feeders you can purchase that around that fit good enough under the lid and you can use that to feed the bees or you can just uh, put some holes in the lid of a jar, put some sugar syrup in it, turn it upside down over that area and the bees can feed through that hole. You could also decide to pull it out altogether and the bees can then use the roof cavity and perhaps you want to put maybe a, um, a clear baking dish over this area and watch the bees build their comb in, in that zone as well if you want to get some honeycomb. Um, some people like to leave it out and let the bees right up into the roof area, but after a while, if the colony is really strong, you get a whole lot of comb built randomly under the roof, which can be exciting for the first few times, but it's also a mess to clean up. So I tend to keep the plug in and limit them from building comb in the roof cavity. Thank you very much for all your questions. Do let us know what you'd like us to cover. Tune in again uh, same time next week, keeper.org, where we've got experts from around the world putting together an online course made to take you from ground zero to being quite knowledgeable in beekeeping with both practical and scientific knowledge. And um, that will be a way to really fast track your beekeeping if you're wishing to do so.